Christmas. And if you have your copy of God's Word, I want to ask you to go ahead and turn to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. After the resurrection of Jesus, the scripture tells us that he appeared on the earth for a period of 40 days. And in fact, he appeared to over 500 people. As we come to John 21, he's already appeared to a collection of the disciples twice. Once he appeared to the disciples when they were in the upper room praying and he revealed to them the hand of the nail prints in his hands and in his feet and where the sword pierced him in the side. But you remember, Thomas wasn't there that time. Thomas, who is often known by us, is the one called Downing Thomas. And so Jesus appears again before the disciples, this time to allow Thomas to put his hands in the hands of Jesus and to see the nail prints for himself. Now, you remember when we left off last week after the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus had uh, sent a message through the angel to the women who had come to the tomb to tell the disciples and Peter. We put real specific point on that. But tell the disciples and Peter to go before him into Galilee, and there he would meet them. So in John chapter 21, we see where seven of the disciples have already made their way to Galilee. And here they are waiting on the arrival of Jesus. And in today's passage, we're going to see an encounter they have with him. However, this is not the specific encounter that he had told them about because only seven of them have collected here in Galilee at this point. So let's look together. John chapter 21, verse 1. It says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Now, Sea of Tiberias is another name for Sea of Galilee. And that had been a place where they had encountered Jesus before, right? They had fishermen. They were from this particular area. It was here where they went out into the boat with Jesus and had that incredible catch of fish. And it says here at the end of verse, 20, at the end of verse 1, and in this way he showed himself. Now this is what we're going to focus on really in tonight's message. After we teach through the text, I'm going to share with you some ways that Jesus showed himself to the disciples, so we'll be looking for that. Verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. What a great idea. As Simon Peter and the other disciples are waiting on the arrival of Jesus, Simon Peter decides he's going to go do what he knows to do. It may have been a while since he had been fishing. And that old fisherman, I'm sure the water was just calling out his name. So Simon Peter decided, instead of just standing there and doing nothing, that he would go and do what he loved to do, and that was to fish. You know, I think there's a lesson that we can learn here. Sometimes we are waiting on God, right? Maybe you've been calling on God and you've been asking Him to guide you in a decision that you make or guiding you in a life plan that you need to develop or maybe guiding you in how to handle a certain situation. And sometimes as we're waiting on God to answer us and waiting on God to tell us the next step that we need to take, sometimes as we're waiting on Him, we just don't know what to do. And in fact, sometimes in the midst of waiting, we're just worrying, wondering when in the world God is going to reveal Himself. And I think Peter is a great example here. Listen, you come to the Word of God, you study His Word, you hear what He has to say, you bring your request to Him in prayer, and when you're waiting on God, just go and enjoy the day. I think it's also pretty neat that what he chooses to do is to go fishing again. He goes to that place where he had encountered Jesus before, and that's the thing that I think we can take away from that as well. Because sometimes when we're just kind of in that period of waiting and we're really wanting to hear from the Lord, but we haven't heard Him specifically yet, I think it's really good for us sometimes to go back to those places where we've encountered Him before. Maybe to read a passage in the Scripture that was incredibly meaningful to you at a time in your life, or uh, maybe reread a book that was really instrumental in helping you grow in your faith, or maybe contacting somebody, an old youth pastor, or an old friend, or, or somebody who really made a difference in your life and helped you encounter God at a specific period of time. I think it's good sometimes to go back to those places, and that's what Simon Peter's doing, and well, the other disciples think it's a good idea too. Look at the end of verse 3. So they said to him, we are going with you also. And they went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. Boy, John's really setting the table for something big here, isn't he? Verse 4. But when morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore 
yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Now, that may have simply been because, well, they were 100 yards away from him. And remember, they'd been fishing during the night. The sun is beginning to come up in the morning. So maybe they just couldn't recognize him from that distance. Verse 5, Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. And drawing it in there means that they weren't able to get it into the boat because there were so many fish that they had caught. In verse 7, therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, by the way, that's the way John would refer him to himself in his own gospel. So this is John. So, uh, therefore, John, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. Now, I want to point something out to you. Uh, One is that the word cast in verse 6 means to throw, like to cast a net or to throw a net out to catch fish. But then here in verse 7, the word plunged is the very same word in the Greek. It also means to throw. So in verse 6, Peter casts a net with the other disciples. But upon seeing that Jesus is the one who had given them that instruction, and recognizing Jesus' presence there on the shoreline, Peter now casts himself into the water and begins to make his way toward him. We'll get back to that in a little bit. Verse 8. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, again, 100 yards, dragging the net with fish. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. That's interesting, isn't it? Because Jesus was already preparing breakfast. He already had that fire of coals. He already had the fish on it, already had the bread. He didn't really need their fish, but as they had had that incredible catch, he invites them to bring what they had to add to what was already there. And in verse 11, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not broken. Now, that gives us a little bit of a pause. Because we have already seen a fishing story in the life of Peter, right? When Jesus was in the boat with the disciples and told them where they needed to cast the net and they caught so many fish, Luke records for us in chapter 5 of his gospel that the nets were beginning to break. However, in this fishing episode, they catch 153 large fish, but the nets did not break. Why in Luke chapter 5 was it so many fish that the nets broke, but in John chapter 21, there's an emphasis John wants us to see that the nets didn't break? I believe it's because Jesus is teaching two different things about himself at two different points in the discipleship of the disciples. In Luke chapter 5, remember, that's a real new encounter with them. And at that particular time, Jesus, as he was calling them to be fisher of men, wanted them to see that he could do exceedingly abundantly above all they could ask or think. He wanted them to see the incredible power of God. But here in John chapter 21, they know about his power. Remember, they're talking to a man who had been resurrected from the dead. But here Jesus is teaching about how he provides their needs, about he is in the details. You see, these guys are going to carry out the ministry and mission of Jesus. In fact, the ancient writer Jerome actually said that in this particular time period, there were 153 different nations or different groups of people, and he writes that the number 153 fish actually speaks of how as the disciples would go and share the gospel, people from the 153 nations, tribes, and tongues would all come to be a part of the kingdom of God. And Jesus is teaching that the church is big enough to handle all of those different people. Now, I'm not so sure that that's exactly right, that that's what Jesus was trying to teach, but very clearly he's teaching that, listen, you go do what I tell you to do And you trust me with the details. I can handle the nets. And so then in verse 12, Jesus said to them, 
come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. And this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. What an incredible moment for these guys. As they're eating breakfast with a resurrected Lord. And then verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, or son of John, do you love me more than these? Now I want to stop right here and explain a few things. One is, I want you to see how uh, Jesus places emphasis on what he calls Peter. Remember last week, after the resurrection of Jesus, when he sent the message to the angel to give to the women, to give to the disciples, it was go and tell the disciples and Peter. And we talked about how, remember, his name was Simon when, Jesus met, when, he, when Simon met Jesus for the first time. But Jesus told him at that first encounter, I'm going to change your name to Peter, which means rock. And he was showing the kind of character he was going to build in his life. And so we've seen along the way through this study that when Peter messes up, he's called Simon or maybe even Simon Peter. But when he does something rock-like, he's called Peter. And after the resurrection of Jesus, when Peter is just crushed. It was the name Peter that Jesus wanted him to hear as a reminder that, listen, I love you, and I have forgiven you, and I still have plans to turn you into a rock, just as I always have, regardless of the mistake that you've made. But now, now Jesus has a little more time with him. The dust has settled a little bit, and all the things that have taken place. And so now, as Jesus calls him Simon, Jesus is forcing Peter to deal with the reality of his sin. And then he asks him the question, do you love me more than these? Now, the word love from the Greek is the word from which the word agape comes, which speaks of a higher love, a, a God type of unconditional love. And when Jesus says, do you love me more than these, scholars debate about what exactly he means by more than these. Some would say that Jesus was looking at the fishing equipment and maybe the fish had been dragged up and essentially that Jesus was saying, Simon, do you love me more than fishing? Because remember, he was a fisherman. That's what he loved to do. But I don't think that's what Jesus was referring to because I think Peter has already proven that he loves Jesus more than fishing. Others say, and I believe this, that as Jesus is saying, Simon, do you love me more than these, that Jesus was actually referencing the other six disciples who were eating breakfast with them. Now, if you remember, before the denial of Peter, Jesus told all of the disciples that on that night they would betray him. And each disciple said, there is no way that I will do that to you. And Jesus again reminded them, no, you all will betray me this night. And remember, Peter looks at Jesus and says, I'm telling you, if every other person here betrays you, you can count on the fact that I never will. In other words, what Peter was essentially saying to Jesus is, listen, you and I both know I love you more than these. And so here on the shoreline, as Jesus calls him Simon and says, do you love me with this higher love more than these? Jesus is essentially asking Peter, you still want to go there? Do you still believe that? Look at his response. Peter said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Now, notice a couple of things about that. First of all, he answers in the affirmative, but he answers based upon what he knows Jesus already knows about him. It's almost as if he's trying to evade the question altogether. He says, you know that I love you. Notice that he drops the more than these. Peter has learned his lesson about making bold claims. He has been incredibly humbled by the events of his denial at the resurrection. And Peter is really careful not to jump out on that ledge. But also with the word love, instead of using the word agape, he uses the word phileo. 
which speaks of a brotherly love or a friendly type of love, a lower level of love than the agape love. This is not that rough, brash, impulsive fisherman we first met, is it? So Jesus said to him there in verse 15 at the end, feed my lambs. And then in verse 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And again, he uses that agape word. And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And again, Peter uses that phileo word. He said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? This time, Jesus changes the word love and brings it down to the level that Peter had been speaking of. So Jesus says, Simon, do you phileo love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, if Peter were able to dig a deep enough hole, he would have loved to have jumped down in it and put the sand up over his head and just hidden in that particular moment. This was incredibly difficult for him. It was extremely embarrassing and humbling for him. So the question is, Why did Jesus do that to him, particularly in the presence of those disciples? The great Alexander McLaren once said, the threefold denial of Peter needed to be obliterated by a threefold confession. What's happening in these verses is that Jesus is bringing true restoration to Peter. Notice it was incredibly difficult. Dealing with sin always is. And as Jesus asks him three times, does he love him? It is a reminder to Peter of the three times that he denied him and a reminder to everybody else sitting around the fire of the three times that Peter had denied him. When he says, do you love me more than these? It reminds him of the bold statement that he had made prior to the denial. And so this is incredibly difficult. It's incredibly embarrassing. But at the same time, with each one of those, Jesus is continuing to give the response, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. He's continuing to invite him to join him in his mission. So as he is dealing with his sin, he is lifting him up. Peter walks into this moment, though he is encouraged because Jesus has invited to meet him in Galilee. Jesus walks into this moment in an incredibly uncomfortable situation, a little bit shaky. But he walks out of this moment as Peter, the rock. Restoration can sometimes be uncomfortable. Because it is as a result of our sin that we need to be restored. And oftentimes what really keeps us from being the people that God wants us to be is our Failure to deal with our sin because we know it can be embarrassing. We know it can be difficult. But my goodness, when this was over, it was as if the elephant jumped off of Peter's shoulders and he would be a new man. Jesus said in verse 18, he said, most assuredly, I say to you, When you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. What does that sound like? Exactly what you think it does. Look at the next verse. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. Tradition states that Peter would actually be crucified as a result of his faith in Jesus Christ. 
So what Jesus is essentially saying to Peter, as Peter affirms his love for Jesus three different times, Jesus says to him, I know you do, Peter. In fact, I know that you will move beyond that phileo love and you will actually live the agape love for me. And when he had spoken this, as we wrap up verse 19, Jesus said to him, follow me. Now, I told you there, looking back at verse 1, John writes, in this way he showed himself. So what I want to do tonight is I want to share with you several ways in this particular passage we see that Jesus has shown himself to the disciples. Number one, Jesus showed them that he knew what they didn't know, right? We see that with the catch of fish. They had been fishing all night. And remember, they, many of them were fishermen by trade. This is what they knew, or at least they thought they knew. But Jesus is able to see from a different perspective they are. You know, it's not even necessary to look at this particular passage is that Jesus has performed a miracle and brought all these fish. It could very well be that from the shore, he just had a different view of the lake than they did, and he knew where the school of fish were. Nonetheless, at his command, they did what he said, and they caught the fish. And so for these disciples, if they're going to be true to carrying out the ministry and mission of Jesus as he is preparing them to do, remember, he is about to ascend back to heaven, and they're going to carry the ball across the goal line. And so if they're going to do that, then they needed to learn that they don't know everything. They needed to know that there were things that Jesus would see that they wouldn't be able to see. They needed to know that they needed to depend upon him. And listen, so do we. But so often we live our lives as if we see everything and we don't really need God. Now, we would never be crazy enough to actually admit that publicly, but our lives demonstrate it. And that so, there are so many days where we wake up in the morning and we drink our cup of coffee and we eat our Cheerios and we read the newspaper and we head off into our day with the greatest of intentions of honoring the Lord, but never seeking Him, realizing that He sees and He knows things that we don't. You see, God is not able to see across geographical lines. God is also able to see against the lines of time. He knows everything, past, present, and future. And if we're going to live our lives in a way that honors Him, we've got to realize He sees things that we don't, and He knows things that we don't, and we need to trust Him. Second of all, Jesus showed them that He didn't need their fish, didn't He? Man, I love that passage where he tells them they can bring their fish and add it to the breakfast as he sits there with a coal of fire and fish already on the coal that's bacon and the bread right there. You see, as these disciples would be fishers of men, they would need to be reminded that Jesus didn't need them. I mean, think about it. Jesus is God. If God can speak the world into existence, why would he need them? He didn't. You see, we have to realize that God doesn't need us either. It doesn't matter how many degrees we have. It doesn't matter how much experience we have. It doesn't matter how much talent we have or how many references we have. God doesn't use us because of what we bring to the table. That is never a part of how God calls. God uses us because he desires to use us. It is by his grace that he uses us. And when we forget his grace and begin to think that we are worthy, man, we're in a heap of trouble. Then all of a sudden, it becomes more about glorifying me than it does about glorifying him. These disciples, they had walked with Jesus for three years. There was really nobody more qualified than they were. But Jesus is clearly sending the message. You know, I don't need you to catch fish. And they would need to be reminded of that, and so do we. Third of all, Jesus showed them that he would provide for their needs. 
Again, I mean, the catching of the fish, 153 large ones. Man, that's a great story, but I love the fact that the nets didn't break. Jesus knew that as the disciples would embark on this ministry that he had given them, there would be a lot of things that they would run into. A lot of, oh my goodness, I wonder what to do here. Or, oh my word, I, I really wasn't prepared for that. There'd be a lot of questions that they would ask along the way, and they would be able to remember this particular moment when it seemed like the nets should have broken, but they didn't. And see, oftentimes when we begin to step out with the Lord and we begin to follow Him, a lot of times those questions come into our minds. What about the money? What about the talents? What about the time? What about this? What about that? No. He's got it taken care of. He wants us to trust Him and let Him take care of the details. Next thing Jesus shows them is Jesus showed them that serving others comes from our love for Him. Notice how in those three times that Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep, he always began it, though, by asking him the question, do you love me? Jesus is clearly showing us that our service for him must always be because of our love for him. You see, sometimes our service for him is because of our love for us. Sometimes we serve him because it makes us feel better about ourselves. Sometimes we serve him because it makes us feel important or it gives us some esteem and satisfaction. Sometimes we serve him because we're trying to earn his favor. Sometimes we serve him because we just know that we're supposed, that's what we're supposed to do. That's what you're supposed to do in church. Been hearing that all your lives. But Jesus is teaching that true service for him comes from the overflow of our hearts. Listen, here at First Baptist Tartville, we value training for people who serve. It's a really good thing to learn some of the X's and O's on how to serve. But the very best way to be trained to serve is to grow in your relationship with Christ because all of the head knowledge in the world, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, it's just a bunch of noise if we don't love God first. That's how you love for others. That's what genuine Christian service comes from. And then Jesus showed them what restoration looks like. Remember, these guys were going to be sent out with that message of restoration. They would share the gospel that lives can be restored, sin can be forgiven when we trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And they needed to know what restoration looked like. So they were able to see that restoration can be difficult, but restoration involves God's incredible grace and his love. Remember, Jesus is initiating this restoration with Peter. Jesus was the one who was offended, but he is initiating it. You see that? We also see where Jesus is bringing things down on Peter's level from agape to phileo, and they needed to see that restoration is about meeting people where they are also needed to see that restoration involves dealing with sin. You got to deal with sin in order to be restored. They needed to see that restoration involves forgiveness, that restoration involves bringing a person back to God's family and what he desires of them. And man, they were able to see every single bit of that. And then finally, Jesus showed them the cost of following him. Listen, when Jesus said to Peter, listen, I know where you're, what you're going to do. I know where this is going to go. There was a time when you were able to gird yourself and go where you wanted to go. But following me is going to lead you to be crucified on a cross. And can't you imagine the faces of everybody around that fire? Mouths dropped. Eyes opened thinking, oh, my word. How different that is than today. I'm sure you read stuff in the newspaper or 
magazines or your news feed on your phone and you hear, just read so many articles about the decline of American Christianity and the decline of churches in America. And I really believe that one of the big reasons for that is because churches are filled with people who at one time in life made a profession of faith but never really cast their lives in with Jesus. Oh, maybe they cast a net to see what they could catch. But they didn't cast their lives. They didn't really understand the cost of following Jesus. You see what these disciples are not doing. After Peter has this incredible restoration moment, and Jesus talks about the cost of following him, and Peter is casting himself in with Jesus, by the way, though it doesn't specifically say that here. We'll see that in the next few weeks. But as Peter is affirming that he loves Jesus and he's willing to follow him to the ends of the earth, and even if it means going to a cross, you don't see the disciples all gathering together and saying, Peter, Peter, come here, come here, and taking a selfie to post on their Facebook or their Instagram account, right? You don't see him kind of collecting some money and going him and buying him a, a real nice pretty suit for the first sermon that he's ever going to be able to preach on his own. You don't see him throwing a big party and inviting all these folks and eating cake because he made this sweet decision that he's going to follow Jesus. You see, that's kind of what we see today, right? A lot of times people, well, they make a profession of faith because they feel like it's going to be, well, their, their parents are going to be pleased or their grandparents are going to be pleased or because, well, their friends did that and they want to be, you know, like their friends. And so it becomes this kind of sweet, kind of cute moment. But for the disciples around that fire, when Peter responds to that invitation from Jesus, when Peter is willing to cast his life in with him, that wasn't a sweet thing. They knew it was a costly thing. And those disciples weren't fooled. They knew how difficult it was going to be to cast in with them. Incidentally, later in his life, Peter would write a letter to a persecuted church, 1 Peter and 2 Peter 2, by the way. But in 1 Peter particularly, he writes this. Beloved, why do you think it's strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you? as if some strange thing has happened to you. But rejoice that you partake in Christ's sufferings. Think about that. Peter is writing to a church that is struggling because they're facing persecution. And essentially, in our language, he's saying, what's the problem? Didn't you know this was a part of the deal? When you signed up. Yet for so many of us, we think the reward of walking down an aisle and professing our faith and being baptized is that we've pleased people. Or that we get to eat cake. Or we get to get some new clothes and take lots of pictures. Or even that Life is going to get a lot easier. But for these disciples, casting in with Jesus was going to cost them their lives. They knew the cost of following him. Well, let's kind of wrap up. We've come full circle with Peter, haven't we? From that brash, impulsive fisherman who speaks and acts before he thinks. Who was able to walk with Jesus casting in his net and seeing all kinds of incredible things. But then struggling with that denying self deal. Just couldn't get himself out of the way. Crashed and burned pretty hard. And after the resurrection of Jesus, and as we see Peter being restored, we don't see a brash, impulsive fisherman. We see a humble, thoughtful rock of a man.
the psalmist in Psalm 1 would consider a more firmly planted tree than chaff which the wind drives away. How could he be that way? How could he come to this point in his life realizing that it probably would cost his life to cast in all in with Jesus? Because through walking with him, he learned that he is who he says he is and does what he says he will do. And remember, the one he would be following had been to a cross and now he was eating fish with him. Kind of like what Paul said. O oh, death, where is your sting? So what has God been saying to you tonight? There are lots of people who come to churches every Sunday and pretty much they're just casting nets. They're throwing it out there. I mean, you've come. You've come to sing songs. You've hum, come to hear the Bible proclaimed. There are lots of folks who are casting out nets hoping to catch some fish. But there's a difference between casting the net and casting your life in there. Have you cast your life out to Jesus? Have you surrendered your all to Him? We need Him. He knows more than we know. His power is greater than our power. We are sinners in need of restoration. The cost of following him is still high. But he is the king and he is worthy. And we should cast in with him. Will you pray with me? Father, we bow before you here this evening and we thank you for again allowing us to study your word and to see how you bring restoration. Father, I pray that as we come to this time of invitation tonight, that you'll help us to truly ponder where we stand with you, whether we've cast nets or we've cast our lives. And Lord, I pray that tonight we'll be able to say, I'm all in. I pray that tonight we will surrender all to you. We believe that you are who you say you are and you do what you say you will do. So, Lord, as we come to this invitation, help us to surrender. In your name we pray. Amen.